things are going to be a little different today, and we'll kind of guide you through the process of what we're going to be doing. But uh, many of y'all already know, and if you don't, that we are going to be having building dedication and um, our building groundbreaking uh, that we are getting ready for and excited about what God's doing um, here in the life around Prairie. And um, we were excited about that. But today, uh, to kind of kick us off, I guess, um, hopefully well, I want to take you to some scriptures that I think we need to take um, and consider today to make sure that we're starting off well um, as a church. You know, when you build something, it's important to start well. Uh, you don't want to start and then figure out later on uh, that you, you wish you would have done things much differently. Everybody ever do that in your life? Like, you kind of wish you had a do-over? How many of y'all, by personality, this, just raise your hand. I'll be honest, I'm going to raise my hand on this one. How many of y'all would admit and say, I'm more of a jump out of the plane and then look for my parachute kind of person? Anybody? Who do we got in there, right? Praise the Lord for y'all, because without y'all, we wouldn't know which mushrooms were safe to eat. We, <laughs> we wouldn't know, you know, we are the reason they put warning labels on things, right? It's that group of people that are the triers and those that kind of We'll figure it out as we go that, that really make a way for the rest of us. Now, some of y'all are what we call early adopters, right? Y'all are, are on board once you realize there's not imminent death through the door, right? You're on board. And then there's some of y'all, and let's just be honest, I'm going to get y'all to raise your hand too, but you're going to have trouble when I describe you. You're what we call late adopters, right? Once it's all thought out, figured out, and everybody knows it's going to work anyway, you'll get on board. How many of those have we got in the room? Anybody? Right? Yeah. Yeah. Y'all are boring. Okay? I just, <laughs> of course you'll get on board. It's obvious it's already working. The first group and the third group don't always jive. Let me just put it that way. And then there's an antagonist group, but I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand because you won't anyway. Okay? But we're excited about building. But I want to talk to you about today about building. But we're going to be talking about building a building. But I really think today's sermon, you can take the principles we learn and apply it to anything in your life that you're trying to build. Whether you're building a business, whether you're building a family, whether you're building a marriage, there are some common principles in building something that we can take from today's message and apply uh, to a, a variety of situations. And so today, I don't want you to feel like you can just check out because we're talking about a building program, because we're talking about building in any arena of life today. And today, I was really trying to avoid this particular uh, passage because it's so stereotypical with building programs, but I just couldn't get around it, and we're going to be looking at Nehemiah chapter 2, okay? I just, I really tried hard. Some of you pastors in the room, you're like, of course you are. Uh, you know what I'm talking about. It just, it's preached and preached and preached to these environments, and um, we're going to do it again, okay? I don't know how else to get around it. Um, but Nehemiah is an interesting character in the Old Testament. He is a captive um, in the land of Babylon, and, and Babylon has undergone some changes, and you have the Medes and the Persians who have kind of taken over. We know through our history that the Greeks will eventually take over, and eventually the Roman Empire will come to, to be. But right now, um, the children of Israel have been in captivity for, for many years, and it's about time for them to go back to the promised land. We know that they were supposed to be there for around 70 years, and that time is coming to an end. And Jerusalem, which is back home, has been just ransacked. And the people of Israel are going to go back to a land that's destroyed, just, just destroyed, just taken down. Walls are down, the city's flattened, and there is a lot of building that they're going to have to do when they get back to their homeland. Well, Nehemiah is a, an official in uh, the king's court, King Artaxerxes, and he hears about the broken down walls of Jerusalem, and it breaks his heart. It breaks his heart. He's devastated because this is his homeland. This is, this is where his roots are. This is uh, where, where people grew up that he knows, and, and these are families that are connected to him. He, he has an emotional attachment to the building that needs to happen in Jerusalem, specifically with the walls. And, and so Nehemiah begins to pray to the Lord about what he should do, and through this time, he realizes he needs to go back and be a part of building back the walls around Jerusalem. 
And so he goes to the king and asks for permission, but not just permission to build. He asked the king to give him passage through these other territories and also letters that will grant him favor so that he can get materials from these other regions to build back the walls of Jerusalem. So you're kind of getting a picture of what's going on with Nehemiah. Well, we're going to catch up to Nehemiah after he gets to Jerusalem. And in verse 9, and what we're going to do today is we're going to read the rest of chapter 2. And I just want us to look at five, I guess, principles of wise builders. Okay? Uh, these, are, these, are, these are an example to follow. This is not a mandate in Scripture here. Just because Nehemiah did this doesn't mean God's commanding it. Okay? I want to make sure you understand the difference, right? This, but I do think there's a, a, a list of principles we can pull out of how Nehemiah does this that will serve us well in our building project, will serve us well in building homes, that will serve us well in building our families, that will serve us well in building our marriage, that, that these principles are transferable to all sorts of areas in our lives. And so if you got your Bibles, read with me in Nehemiah chapter 2, starting in verse 9. It's this, then I, this is Nehemiah talking, then I came to the governors of the province beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king has sent with me officers of the army and horsemen. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant heard this, it displeased them greatly that someone had come to seek the welfare of the people of Israel. So I went to Jerusalem and was there three days. And then I rose in the night and a few men with me, and I told no one what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There was no animal with me but the one which I rode. I went out by night by the valley gate to the dragon spring to the dung gate, and I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that were broken down and its gates that had been destroyed by fire. And then I went on to the fountain gate to the king's pool, but there was no room for the animal that I was under me to pass. And then I went up in the night by the valley and inspected the wall, and I turned back and entered by the valley gate and so returned and the officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing and I had not yet told the Jews the priests the nobles the officials and the rest who were to do the work then I said to them you see the trouble we are in how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned come let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision and I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good, and also of the words that the king had spoken to me. And they said, Let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. And when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite, servant and Geshem the Arab, heard of it, they jeered at us and despised us and said, What is this thing that you're doing? Are you rebelling against the king? And then I replied to them, the God of heaven will make us prosper, and we his servants will arise and build, but you have no portion or right or claim in Jerusalem. Five wisdom principles I want to give you today that we can pull from the story of Nehemiah here. Just to catch you up, Nehemiah is looking around Jerusalem. We catch up to him there in verse 11, and it says he goes up to Jerusalem, and he's there three days. Now, what's he doing during these three days? Do you all see what he's doing? He's riding around inspecting the walls. He's riding around looking at the state and the condition of the city. He needs to know if he's going to lead well in this rebuilding, what is it he's got to do to accomplish the task in front of him? Now, what I find fascinating about this is if you look at chapter 1, verse 4, his response when he hears about the brokenness before he sees it, it says, as soon as I heard these words, I sat down and I wept and mourned for days and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. But what I want you to see is that all the emotion and all the passion and all the, 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 the internal drive that Nehemiah had that was fueling this, this mission did not overtake the logic he was given by God to assess properly the work that needed to be done. Why do I say this? Because it's important in anything we build that we don't let emotion rule us but we let wisdom that I would say is logic sometimes guide us to what we need to do next. 
Now, church, I want you to hear me because this is an important one for us. As a church, it's important that we let wisdom from God, not the emotion of man, guide us as we move forward in this process. Amen? It's important. Because just like I told y'all, I'm the type of guy that likes to jump out of the plane first and then find my parachute, which is really not true. I would never jump out of an airplane, okay? It was an an illustration, uh, so to speak. As a matter of fact, I don't know if you know this, but I'm a pilot. And I haven't included that in a while in my sermon. And tragically, someone just last week said, you're a pilot? And they were for real. And I realized I had not said that lately. So there you go. People say, you wouldn't skydive? I'm like, heck no. Well, you're a pilot. I said, I stay in the plane, right? There's a huge difference. I don't know if you know this. Next time you get on a, on a Southwest flight and you look out the window, ask yourself, do you feel more comfortable inside? Or would you like to be jettisoned outside? Think about it, right? It's a no-brainer to me. I love it inside. Don't think I would love it outside. Good inside, bad outside, right? All right, now that we got that clear, right? But my personality is to tend to leap before I look. Here's the other thing, and and I'm going to get really personal with y'all and honest for a minute, okay? I want everybody to hear me because I'm going to speak to Round Prairie specifically right now, okay? I have a weakness as a leader sometimes that I love new so much that I will tear something up that's working just so I can build it back new again. I, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a true temptation for me. I get bored easily. Like, I didn't know what was going to happen. When I pastored here, I've been here eight years, I was like, man, I love those first few years of building new ministry, building new ministries, uh, bringing on new staff. I love that. But at some point, things are working. Not everything. There's always something to work on. But there are things that are going good. And I have a tendency to want to sometimes tinker with things that don't need to be tinkered with just yet. That's not a surprise, right? And so sometimes my emotion of loving the newness of things can cause me to not walk wisely. You follow me? Now, church, here's what I got for you. I think on the opposite end of that spectrum, sometimes nostalgia for what has been prevents us from moving forward where God would have us to be. Now, it's, and here's where it's going to get real personal. You ready? Part of all of this is we've said there is some taking down of some facilities that we have that I know have a lot of milestones for a lot of people in this building. Did you know that I preached my first sermon ever in our other building? Did you know that? Did you know that I baptized my boys in that building? Did you know that? Did you know I surrendered to preach in that building right there? I would venture to say that I have more milestones in that building than the average bear. I would. I would venture to say that nostalgia though is not hard for me because i love new right i'm not discounting that it's difficult for you i'm challenging you though to think am i holding on to something because uh, it's nostalgic or am i willing to let go because we need to move forward i want y'all to hear me When Nehemiah goes back to the walls, he is emotionally charged. There is no doubt. But he steps back for a minute and assesses the situation, takes a clear inventory of what is actually going on so that he can make the best possible decision for what needs to happen moving forward. Church, we must never get so attached or charged emotionally that we cannot see the wisdom of God moving forward. We have to be willing to step back from our own preferences, our own personalities, our own wishes, and say, God, is this me wanting it because it makes me feel good, or am I wanting it because it advances your kingdom in this world? Because the advancement of the kingdom is what should drive everything that we do with this church. Nothing else. The fact that I baptized my son should not drive my decision on that building. What should drive it is what is the most beneficial to the kingdom of God moving forward. 
And we are thankful for our past, but we must never be shackled to it. Amen? We are thankful for the people who have gone before us. I spent this week, and I ate lunch with Pastor Ed Rich. And Ed was pastor here for almost two decades. And I really tried to get Ed to come today. I really wanted him to. Because Ed was a mentor to me. Ed Ed taught me so much about loving people. Ed and I are polar opposites. Brother, Ed and I are polar opposites in almost every way. But one way I believe we are the same is that we love the Lord and we love this body. And I respect greatly everything that Ed did to lay a foundation that we've been able to build up on here today. We don't discount that, but we also don't squander the opportunity by staying there. I hope one day people tear down, quote, unquote, our buildings. Amen? I hope that one day they look and go, man... That served us well, but God is going this direction. That served us well for a season, but we've got to move forward. That has got to be our passion. We let logic dictate, wisdom dictate more than emotion. That's what Nehemiah is doing. He's taking a logical approach. He's not letting his emotion take over. He's still stepping back and taking an honest assessment. So if you're going to be a wise builder, you've got to make logical assessments. Number two, wise builders, and we're going to go through the rest of this a little quicker, Do not go it alone. Look at verse 17. It says as he goes through here, it says, Then I said to them, this is after he takes the assessment. He says, You see the trouble we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. Come let, what's the word? Us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. If you look back up in in, in the verses preceding that, it, it says that he didn't even tell them He says, the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, and the rest who were to do the work. In other words, Nehemiah knows that this is going to happen. It has to involve more people than Nehemiah. If if, if this wall is going to get built, Nehemiah says, I'm going to have to be a leader, but these people are going to be the ones who actually make it happen. Do not make the mistake of thinking that Nehemiah built the wall around Jerusalem. Nehemiah led the people who built the wall around Jerusalem. Church, hear me when I say this. If we are to take on this project and move forward and see it to completion, it will not be because the pastor did it. It will be because every single person in the seats decided that we are going to collectively be a part of the work of doing this for the furtherance of the kingdom of God. It is a we project, not a me project. If it's a me project, we need to stop right now. It has to be the body coming together like pieces of a puzzle making one consistent, solid picture of moving this place to the next phase that God has for us. It has to be the whole body coming together. You may be sitting out there going, well, Chris, what does that look like for me? I don't know specifically what it looks like for you, but I know this. If you're part of the body of Round Prairie, you have a part in the work of this ministry moving forward. You do. You do. You're like, well, Chris, I don't know that I can give a big check. I don't know that I don't have much to offer. I can only do this. I can only do that. Do what God allows you to do and be faithful to do your part. I want to tell you, we talk about this all the time. We cannot afford to sit back and wait for others to do it. We have to collectively come together and commit to taking on this ministry. It's got to be a, a we project, guys. It can't just be something that that two or three people do. It has to be the body that comes together. I want you to hear that. And that's, that's for the facility. I want to tell you, in your marriage and, and in your home, you don't need to do that alone either. Did you know I have men in my life that we collectively challenge one another to be better husbands, that we collectively challenge each other to be better, better dads, that we collectively, everything in life is better pretty much when we do that. So much of Christianity, everything in Christianity pretty much is to be done with an us mentality. And if you're out there and you're kind of an isolationist and you're like, yeah, but I don't like people in my business, sorry. But you need people in your business if you're going to become the man or woman God's called you to be. you got to have it. Not everybody needs to be in everybody's business, amen? Not everybody needs to be in everybody's business, but somebody needs to be in your business. Someone that cares about the kingdom of God being worked out in your life. 
Somebody that wants to see you become the woman God's called you to be. Someone that, that, that wants you to become the man God's called you to be. If you don't have people like that in your life, you don't have a collection around you who is helping pour into you, you are missing so much of the strength of the body of Christ. So much is missing. Do not go it along. Wise builders, do not go it along. Thirdly, wise builders align with God's activity. Look at verse 18, what he says. He says, and I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good and also the words that the king had spoken to me. Nehemiah says, look, I'm not coming to you, and this is the first time I've thought about this. He he said, I didn't come to Jerusalem, and I'm trying to pitch an idea to y'all that I have. He says, the hand of God has already been shown, and it is in favor of the walls being rebuilt. How do we know that? He said, well, when I went and I prayed and I fasted, he said, I went to the king after, and this pagan king pours out blessings and favor for the work of God. How does that happen? How does a king that is holding a people captive have his mind changed so much that he now not only allows Nehemiah to go back, But now he provides Nehemiah everything he needs to go back and then says, I'll also provide all the lumber that you need to build the walls as well. The only way that happens is that God was in this process. And Nehemiah understands that if he's going to succeed in the work ahead, he needs to make sure that that work is aligning with God's activity and not simply his own idea. Why is that important? Because as a church, we can have all sorts of great ideas. We can have all sorts of great ambitions. We can have all sorts of great thoughts. And and we can go to the next great church growth conference. But if we're not aligning locally with what God is doing, we are out of bounds of the favor of God. And if if we want to successfully go through anything, whether it's a building project, a new ministry, our home, our family, a marriage, a relationship... We need to make sure that God's activity and our activity are lined up. It's important. I've heard it said, and you have too, I'm sure. We need to find out where is God moving and how do we join him? Where is God moving and how do we join him there? I'll tell you a little story. Some of y'all were here for this and some of y'all have not been. So I want to kind of help you understand how Round Prairie has gotten to where Round Prairie is today. Uh, a, a few years ago, we were... Uh, meeting in in our older auditorium, and as we grew, it became very evident to us that we were out of room. Now, I was told that building held about 200 people, but that's if you're on each other's lap. Let's just be honest, right? How many of y'all came from the old building, and if you sat on the last three uh, pews, you better hope you don't have legs, right? You know what I'm talking about. It was like, let's just see if we can squeeze three pews in a space that should have two. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Do y'all remember that? And, and you, you, I mean, you out of the bathroom, just, just going yourself, because you ain't getting out, right? Like, I mean, like, it is a, it's an hour. When you sit down there, you are committed. It's like getting inside the space shuttle. You're not going to switch seats. I mean, you got a seat. They're going to buckle you up. You're waiting until you get to the moon. You ain't getting out early. That's what I imagine it would be like. Anyway, um, I just literally thought about we should have used to, we should have issued like, never mind, I shouldn't say that. Um, anyway, thinking about urinals and astronaut food. But anyway. Uh, in those rows, looking back, that would have been a great idea. Uh, see, that probably not. Probably not. That, that's the parachute. I forgot the parachute. Urinals to the visitors, probably not a good idea. We could have logoed them. I mean, it would have been amazing. Like, <laughs> I love marketing. Anyway, um, I've got a round prairie urinal. Sorry. Uh, anyway, I was going somewhere. Okay, here's where I'm going. So it became apparent. Now, now this wasn't the first time around prairie has grown to that. There's been two other times in the life of around prairie that space became an issue, and one was with Pastor Henry Horton, and one was with Pastor Ed Ridge. And I looked back at two decades of, of church numbers, as much as I could find, and I was like, man, this isn't a, a, wow, Chris is an amazing pastor. Look at this place. This place has done this several times, which was kind of humbling, right? It's like, well, it's not you. Um, and so I went to the church and said, would y'all be open to starting another service? But I don't want to start another service exactly like we have. I'd like to start one different. Now, we didn't even know what that meant at that time until we, we went into a church that was doing something kind of like our loft service was. And I came back to the church and said, we'd like to start a service up there 
and we would like to, to have it very casual. We'll serve coffee, <laughs> and um, we'll, we'll have coffee, and, and we'll just we'll make it super casual. It'll be like a coffee shop vibe. How many of y'all went to, how many of y'all started here because of the loft? How many of y'all, see? Some of y'all here started at the loft, right? I love the loft. It was great up there. No bathroom. Again, back to the urinal idea. Would have been amazing. But anyway, so we, we start that, and we see, man, God just blesses, just boom, blows it up. The last Sunday we were in the loft, we were hoping to gain about 30 or 40 new people space-wise. We had 150 people in the loft the last Sunday we were in there. And we decided we wanted to move downstairs into the gym and have one service again. But here's the question that was asked, and I'll never forget this. I, if you remember, we had a town hall in the fellowship hall, and I said, ask all the questions you want to ask. First question out of the box pretty much was this, because we were doing a very more traditional service, and we were doing a much more progressive style service, newer music, things like that. And somebody said, what are we going to do for the music? And if you remember, I said this. I said, look, here's the numbers. Here's the growth of these two services. It seems clear to me that the loft is where God is doing the most. What I want us to do is get on board with what God seems to be blessing. I want to align with where God seems to be working the most. And that was my only logic. It wasn't because I like this music better than that. It wasn't because I have to have a donut. I can't wait an hour. It wasn't that. I don't even eat the donuts. I don't really like our coffee here. Honestly, I don't. I don't. It's just, just kind of strong. I'm not man enough for it, I guess. And I make it a lot of times. I shouldn't, not, not a matter of that. It's just y'all have a different taste. Y'all love that Sam's Choice coffee. I, just, I don't like it. I like truthy coffee. I like girly coffee. Anyway, so it's not that. Literally, the only logic was I think God's working here. And I want us to do where God, I want us to align with where God seems to be doing the most work. That was it. And that's what we decided to do. And at that point, we moved down here, and we had space for about 300 people. And we had 300 people the first week. We were like, well, we ran out of room. Week one. But what I'm saying is, then we ran into COVID. That was a fun time, right? And, and so when we got into COVID, we were building this building. We we're, were actually expanding this building, okay? I'm trying to give you a little history of the church. We took, this building was um, one bay smaller. And so we added this bay on and said, well, that'll, that'll allow us to get four or 500 people in there. And so we, we built this bay, then COVID hit. We didn't really need the extra bay quite as much until about a year ago. And then we, we went from three, and now we run about 400. About the last 12 months, we average right at 400. And so all we've done, though, is, is we're just trying to align with what God's doing. That's it. And I'm not saying that to, to oversimplify. I'm not trying to say it to be noble. I'm saying I think that's what we are called to do in everything in our life. God, where are you working, and how can I get on board with that? There's, there's an old saying in ministry, you, you, know, you don't, there are waves that come through a church, right? You cannot create a wave of momentum. What I would say is you can't create the wave of God's activity. You've got a responsibility to catch the ones that God sends your way. When God provides people, to, to do something specific, and, and God's working in that, you better do everything you can to catch that wave, because that's where God's at. Nehemiah is not just going to build a wall. He's going to catch God's activity. He's going to, to, to line up with what God is wanting to do in Jerusalem. As a leader, the reason it works so well is not because Nehemiah had a great idea. It's because it was God's idea to begin with. And God begins to bless Nehemiah in such a way that Nehemiah goes, yeah, the reason we're going to do this is because I already see God working. I already see God working. Church, the reason we're building is not because it's a clever idea. Can I give, can I give you all a secret? Don't tell anyone. I don't like building projects. I don't. I've not really met a lot of pastors that love them. It's like it's your job. Imagine it's your job. Things are going great. It's, and your boss comes and says, hey, I want to add a tremendous headache to your week. I want to add extra work for you to do. I, I want to add fundraising now to your job description. I, I want to add all these other things. And I'm not saying that to be pessimistic. What I'm saying is we're not doing it because it's my idea. We're doing it because through prayer and through conversations and through counsel, we truly believe 
it's where God's moving next. That's it. And so when people say, well, well or why are we doing this? It's really what we believe through the Nehemiah moment of, of doing all the number crunching, all the looking, all the talking, all the consulting, and through all the prayer, it just seems to be like the next thing God's got. That's why we're doing it. That's it. It's not so we can have the snazziest building in Fairfield. It's, it's not. It's so that we can continue to be on board with God's activity in this community to expand his kingdom. Wise builders understand that. You align with God's activity, and you're going to see that in a minute. Why? But the fourth thing is this, and we're going to be wrapping up here pretty soon. Wise builders handle opposition. This is kind of out of the middle of nowhere, right, in verse 19, and you see it in verse 9 as well. You have these people that are coming up against it. Not everybody's excited about rebuilding the wall. As a matter of fact, there are some people, one guy named Sanballat, but I mean, if that's your name, I'd be mad too. Anyway, and he's a horror knight. If that wasn't bad enough, he's, he's a horror knight. Um, anyway, I got in there. Uh, Tobiah, the Ammonite, servant of Geshem, the Arab, heard of it. And they jeered at us and despised us and said, what is this thing you're doing? Are you rebelling against the king? They said, look, why are you trying to build this wall? In other words, there's opponents, there's opposition to the work of God about to take place in Jerusalem. Can I, can I let you all in on another clue? There's always opposition to God's work in this world. There's always opponents. There's always naysayers. There's always a sand ballot around. I was listening in a little bit to y'all study school in this room. There were several of y'all in this class, and Matt Smith was teaching. And I heard him say something that we talked about last week. He talked about the scoffers. And I love the way Matt said it. He goes, God, scoffers are just, they're going to always be here. They're, they're just going to be here. That's just a reality of life. Can I tell you something? In church, if you wait till there's no opposition, you will never do anything for the kingdom of God. There will always be opposition. There, that opposition may be without, may be outside. Sometimes that opposition even comes from trusted people inside. But as a wise builder, you have to expect and anticipate that not everybody's going to be excited about moving forward as you are, and you have to begin to deal with the opposition in front of you. If you walk through life in your marriage and you think that everybody's on board for your marriage, you are deceiving yourself. You have friends, quote-unquote friends around you, that are not for your marriage. You need to look for those people. I can't tell you how many people I've counseled over the decade, last two decades that would have been a lot better off if they would have just ditched a couple of friends long before. Their marriage was uprooted and destroyed because of a quote-unquote friend's influence in their lives. Families. We need to understand that not everybody is for us leading our families in the way of godliness. There are going to be people who come against us. There are going to be people who say, well, I don't understand why your kids can't do that. My kids do that. And you have to say in the nicest way possible, well, I'm not raising heretics. Right? You have to say it in the nicest way possible. Well, I'll let my kids do that. I don't know why you won't let yours. Have you met your kids? Like, really? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, you don't want to be rude. But the reality is, is we're not all heading the same direction. We need to make sure that when we're going in a certain direction, that we notice and recognize the people that are not. Not so that we can kill them, but that so that we can address them as such. Not everybody is for you. Not everybody's for your family. Not everybody's for Round Prairie. Not everybody's for this building. And that's okay. We expect that and we anticipate that. Just make sure that if the church is moving a direction that you don't become a sand ballot in the mix. Because that can happen real quick in a church building project. I'll be honest with you, the pastor who's led three building projects in three different churches I've been in, the most difficult people in the building project was never outside the church. It was the church that made a decision collectively. We're moving forward collectively. You even voted for it, and now you're throwing roadblocks in the way. I don't know what that is. Maybe you're a horror knight. I don't know. <laughs> but regardless, <laughs> all the Bible guys were like, <laughs> he said horror knight. Um, expect opposition and move forward. And then lastly, wise builders, and this one I cannot overstate. Wise builders trust God. Look at verse 20. I love this because they, they're coming against him with these accusations. 
And in verse 20, he says, Then I replied to them, The God of heaven will make us prosper. The God of heaven will make us prosper. But you have no portion or right or claim in Jerusalem. See, Nehemiah had a keen awareness that he was doing the work that God had him to do. And because of that, he had the keen awareness and assurance that God would be the one to make it prosper. See, that's the beautiful thing. When you align yourself with God's activity, you can rest because the consequences and the results are no longer in your hands or in the hands of someone bigger. It may not be the consequences you always want. It might not be what you wish. But when you align with God's activity, you can leave the consequences and results up to Him because He's the one that's going to make it succeed. Church, hear me. No matter what we do, you can close your Bible. No matter what we do, no matter how much we plan, no matter how much we prepare, no matter how many discussions we have, nothing we do can replace the power of God in our midst. I want you to hear me. Do not let this become a mechanical exercise in just another building. It's just a building, guys. It is just a tool that we're going to see God use. But the endeavor to do it is going to take the hand of Almighty God working in our midst and in our hearts to do it. We don't want to leave the successful completion of this project, the successful completion of our marriage, the successful completion of our child raising, whatever we're trying to build, we don't ever want it to be that we're trusting in our control and our ability more than anything else. We have to know that when we align with God, we're trusting in Him to do the work that we cannot. God can make it happen. Someone asked me this week, or two weeks ago, they asked me a little bit about it, and they said, do you really think we're going to be able to raise the rest of the money? And I said, absolutely. And they said, well, how do you know? I said, well, because I think God's in it. It's not because I have the goods on some rich people, and I'm going to extort them. That's not what's happening. The reason I'm so firm that God is going to do this is because I really believe we're aligning with God's activity. And if we do that, I'm really trusting that God is going to do what only God can do, and God will make it prosper. If you're not doing ministry that way, you need to get out of the ministry. If you're not doing life that way, you need to realign your life. If you're not living life where you're trusting in God for the results, you're really not living a life of faith that God's called us to live. I tell people all the time, I really believe that if your life never requires you to step out in a way where God doesn't show up, you're going to look foolish, you probably aren't living a life of faith. If you're living a life that you can control, contain, and maneuver, and you can accomplish everything that needs to be done in your own power, it's highly doubtful that you're really living a life of boldness for the kingdom of God. Faith requires trust. Not trust in myself, but trust in Him. Guys, I want to call you to understand that what we need more than we Honestly, goodness, I'm not just saying this as lip service. Of course I want y'all to give to this project. Of course. Of course it's going to give me some, some more peace when it's all funded. Of course. I'm not going to lie about that. But you know what we really need more than your money? We need your prayer. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. We're not, he's got the money. We need his power to be present in our midst. We need his power to work among us. We need his power to be present as we move forward. Husbands, you need the power of God present in your marriages. Wives, you need the power of God present in your relationship with your husband. Parents, you need the power of God present as you raise up your children. Because one thing I've learned about having kids now that I have some moving out of the house is like, you can do everything you think you can possibly do to make them turn out a certain way, but you get to realize something real quick. At some point, they have to decide what they're going to do with God. And you need Him to be working to make their life prosperous in a way that only He can do. So here's the question. Let me do a quick song of invitation. 
will you commit with me to follow these principles? Will you commit to looking out for the mission of the church more than even the buildings? And that includes the new ones, right? We can get attached to anything. Will you all commit to saying, what is the mission of this church? And how, do, how, do what we, how does what we do next move that forward? That, that's what should be on all of our hearts and minds. Will you commit to supporting this as part of the body here at Round Prairie? Would you consider God's plans more than your own? Will you work to calm opposition as we move forward? Can I get a witness? Amen, right? Got so many things, so many things could be handled out there if we would just handle them as the body. I've been a part of the body and not been the pastor. And, and you know, I know it's easy. To, it's a water cooler talk. We, would, we don't want to say anything. But can, can I tell you something? So much division and so many problems in a church could be handled in the moment they occur if we would be bold enough to stand in the gap as God's people. I mean, so thankful. This, just this morning, someone else was offended. I hadn't talked to him. I, I promise y'all, I try to talk to you. I re- just let me clear it up right now. I like everybody. And, and if I'm not talking to you, it's not on purpose. It's because there's a lot of y'all and I don't know who I got to. If you really want to talk to me, I hope you know you can always talk to me. But, but, but the thing I loved about this conversation I had with the person telling me about this is they said, I went, whoa, whoa, whoa. Now, I know something about our pastor, and they began to try to set this person clear because they already knew the, the character I hope that, that I have with them. And I'm like, that's what we need more of in churches. We need churches who collectively come together for the betterment of the church. Do you know how many things come to my desk that honestly could have been handled far before they ever got to me? Why, why aren't they? It's because we're not doing our best as the body to maintain unity of the people. Man, there's times that things do come to me and they have to, I get that. But I love it when I hear that the body acted as the body. And the opposition was was squelched where it was at. And wisdom was brought into the conversation. Guys, I don't have a principal's office, okay? I wanna tell you right now, I, I know that some people think that the pastor's office is not the principal's office. It's not where you come to tattle. Yes, it is a place where you should be able to get wisdom and understanding after you have done what you can to take care of it yourself. I want to challenge y'all. If we go through these next couple of years, there's going to be a lot of this. I'm just shooting you straight. There's going to be so much of this, right? You know what I've noticed about this? It has to have this usually to keep going. You know, if you become really boring to talk to, people stop talking around you a lot of times. It's just a reality. Let's be people who endeavor to keep the unity and the spirit of the bond of peace. Let's, let's seek that as a body. And will we pray and trust the Lord as we move forward? Those are the things I'm asking you to commit to. So Chris is going to sing a song. The band's going to play. And I just want you all to spend some time praying during this time of invitation before we dismiss what is it that we need to be praying for? And we've, we've explained that. Will we commit to doing that throughout this process? Let's pray and let's stand and let's respond. God, thank you for this day. Thank you for your faithfulness, your goodness. Thank you for this group of people in this room. God, I thank you that we have time to look into your word, to, to read things that are refreshing, but things that are hard, things that are convicting, God. God, let us be people who make peace, don't seek to create division, and certainly seek to stop it. Let us, God, be a people who who are on fire for the work of the ministry. Let us, God, be kingdom-minded, mission-minded. Let us put aside our own preferences so that your kingdom may be expanded, God, myself included. God, let me put aside the petty things that I want to make sure that your kingdom goes forth in power and in glory. God, I pray, God, as we face the opposition that will inevitably come, that, God, you would walk us through it 
And let us consistently realign with your activity, knowing that you are the one who will make it prosper. God, we love you, and we praise you. It's in the name of Jesus we ask these things. Amen.